So without further ado, please welcome Kelly Jenkins. Thank you. Today we're going to be talking about rethinking blogging for businesses. So I was explaining a little bit before we were, we were just chatting, uh, Oren, right? I didn't actually officially meet you, but we were chatting beforehand about the different types of blogging for businesses. So there are some people who blog for their business and they actually make money just straight from their blog. So that's the people that, you know, that maybe they make money from affiliate links or they make money from selling ad space on their blog. But then there's the, someone's talking to me. There's also the types of people who have blogs that attract customers. And so people are blogging for the sake of putting content out there that ranks in search engines and that performs on social media and they get customers interested in their business from that. So the latter is what we're going to be talking about mostly today. So before we dive in, I just want to introduce myself again, just briefly. I know. Thank you for introducing me. My name is Cameron. Um, if you would like to tweet about the session or anything like that, my handle is at the bottom there. Um, as well as the hashtag for WordCamp Santa Clarita. So you can do that. That's going to be at the bottom of all of my slides. Um, so yeah, definitely don't uh, feel like you have to rush to write anything down. You can tweet about the session or ask me any questions or anything that you want um, or just comment on it. And I think we'll also have time later. I can answer any questions later as well. So I know um, no one came here to hear me talk about myself. I definitely don't want to like belabor this point, but I think introducing my background will help serve with some helpful context for the, the rest of the presentation. So a little bit about my background. I have been in the digital marketing world for about eight years. Um, a bulk of that time has been spent at Scorpion. So if anyone is local to Santa Clarita, hopefully I think some of you probably at least are, um, Scorpion is local to Santa Clarita. They've been in the, uh, in the area for a long time. So I was there for about six and a half years. My job there was leading a team of search engine optimization professionals. So some of them were content developers, uh, some of them were local SEO specialists, some of them were SEO strategists, but what does that mean? So I want to err on the side of explaining everything because I know it's beginner's day. Uh, I don't want to assume that anyone does or doesn't know anything. So um, if I feel like I'm, if you feel like I'm belaboring a point, it's just I want to err on the side of explaining everything. So search engine optimization and content marketing, what does that all mean? It essentially means that I was responsible for the team that was trying to get people's websites to show up in Google. When you perform a search, you know, you wanna, you wanna be able to find relevant, helpful information. Um, there's two sides to the search engine. There's the paid side, where you pay per click, um, that's PPC, and then there's the organic side, which is what my team was responsible for. So after Scorpion, I went to work at Moz. Um, Moz is an SEO software company, so it was pretty cool to get to work there because I used their tools when I was at Scorpion. So then I got to, a chance to do content marketing and SEO for Moz, which is awesome. And now um, as my contract with Moz is winding down, I'm working for my own business that I started, Soapboxly, and we're doing the same thing. So we're doing SEO and content marketing and doing all of these things, producing content so that our customers get to attract their ideal customers. And then I also blog for industry publications like Search Engine Journal and LSA and Insider. <clears throat> so why do I mention all of that? So I mention all of that because I have spent a lot of time blogging for businesses, like an inordinate amount of time. So after a while though, I kind of started to wonder, like, is this even making an impact? Are people even reading these blogs? <clears throat> And if so, if they are reading them, how does that even help my client's business? You know, when I first got started in digital marketing, it was pretty soon after college, soon after I graduated. And um, I don't know if you all remember how you were back in that stage, but I was just happy to get paid. <laughs> and I was happy that I had a job. I was happy that someone was giving me a paycheck. I didn't really question why I was blogging. Our clients were paying us money and I was like, this is great. I'm getting paid to blog and I'm not questioning why. <laughs> but then after a while, I started to think, I was like, okay, these clients are paying good money for these blog posts. Like, what are they getting out of this? And I started to think like, are people reading this stuff? Is it performing? Like any good business owner or marketer, you're gonna have to start asking the question, are you making more money on this than you're spending on it, right? Because otherwise you won't be in business for very long. So who is this talk for? I think hopefully this talk is gonna hit on, um, you know, all different types of people. It's gonna be relevant to a lot of different groups. So I think number one, it can be relevant for business owners. So if you own your own business or you own your own maybe side hustle or side project, 
hopefully it's gonna be relevant for you because blogging can really help your business attract potential customers, whether you're doing the blogging yourself or maybe you're freelancing or hiring out and having someone do the blogging for you. It's also helpful for marketers, people who are in the marketing industry. So if you're responsible, maybe you work at a business doing the marketing, um, you can feel free to go in. <laughs> no, it's okay, hi, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> I know it's always awkward to walk right in, but no, that's the easiest way. Don't, no, don't be sorry. That's the easiest way to get to your seat. Um, so it's also for marketers and it's also for bloggers, obviously. I mean, this talk is rethinking blogging for businesses. So it's going to also be helpful for people who are getting paid money to write blogs for businesses. Hopefully we can do it smarter and better and hopefully have a better result. And it's also for people who do search engine optimization. So these are the people, maybe they're not doing the content directly, but they're in charge and responsible for making websites show up prominently in search engines like Google. So I think it could be relevant for any and all combination of these types of people. So this was my hypothesis when I started putting this presentation together. My hypothesis was that business blogs are broken. So how business blogging typically works, it's pretty simple. This is usually my experience with clients. They will hear somehow that blogging is what they should be doing. So maybe they're talking to a friend. Their friend says, hey man, I've gotten a lot of, I've gotten a lot of potential clients from blogging. People are finding my blogs in search engines or on social media, and I'm getting a lot of attention that way. Or maybe the business owner is struggling to get new customers and they're doing a lot of Googling about how to get new customers, how to get more clients. I'm struggling, I need, I need help. Um, and they'll probably stumble on a blog on Forbes or something like that and has a list of these things you should do to get more clients and more customers and blogging's usually on them. I mean, you've probably all heard that blogging is a good thing to do, but not a lot of us know exactly why or we can't really articulate, okay, I hear blogging is important, but why exactly is this so important? So a business owner usually hears that it's important. Then they decide, okay, I'm either gonna pay a blogger to do it. Maybe I pay you know, someone on Elance or whatever, text broker, all those different freelance platforms are today, or someone who just wants to blog for the business, or they decide, you know, I know my business best, no one knows my business better than me, so I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna reserve some time in my day to blog. So regardless of who's doing it, blogs start to go up on the website at um, a regular cadence or maybe a spotty cadence, depending on, you know, how much time you've left for yourself. I know for me, um, it's kind of hard to get, you know, regular blog posts up just because we're all so busy. That's, it's a, a thing that takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. So that's how it typically works. But is this even doing anything? So I decided to test it. Now before I get into the details of the test that I ran, I wanted to kind of explain why I ran a test. So throughout the course of all the time I've been in digital marketing, I have been asked by lots of upset clients, why am I not getting any traffic? So I usually end up getting pulled into these situations where a client is saying, I have been blogging or I have been paying your company to blog for me for three months or six months or 12 months or even longer sometimes. And they're just frustrated. They're wondering why after all this time exchanging money to get these blog posts among other things, why they're not getting the traffic that they thought they would get. Um, and so usually what I end up having to do is I perform a content audit. So what I do is I go into their Google Analytics, I try to see if it's true, because sometimes clients, you know, if you all work with clients, sometimes they freak out over small things. We all have our, that could be a talk in and of itself on managing clients, oh my goodness. But um, <laughs> definitely one of those situations where you wanna corroborate it, you wanna make sure that the data backs up what they're saying. So you go into Google Analytics and you try to see, okay, is this actually true? Are they getting any blog views? If so, where are the blog views coming from? Um, how popular is their blog? You know, what have we been doing for them? Is it successful? And usually what I find is sadly, no, sadly it's not been successful. They have maybe one or two blog posts that are performing well in search engines and the rest are just falling flat. No one is finding them. Maybe they got a couple hits on social media the first day it was posted. And then it kind of trails off if you've ever seen like Google Analytics, you know, posted on social and then it just dies after that and there's no traffic. So that's been my experience in the past. And uh, that's been my experience in the past. So I wanted to test to see if this was true on a, on a broad scale. If this wasn't just my personal experience, I wanted to see if this was true of most business blogs. So this is the result. So the test that I ran, I found that 65% of business blogs don't get any organic traffic. Now again, by organic, I mean specifically visits originating from a search engine like Google and not the ad portion, the organic 
portion. So I have this shortened link up here. If you want to visit it, you can view and I'll post my slides too. So you could grab this link later as well. Um, but essentially, it's just like a longer write up of my methodology behind the study. Um, it's not something where I evaluated millions and millions of business websites um, that would take time that no, <laughs> no one has. But what I tried to do is grab a representative sample. So I grabbed, you know, a bunch of different websites from businesses across the country, They're all different types, lawyers and plumbers and dental offices from all different cities throughout the US. The, like the qualifying factor was that they had a blog. I wanted a true sample of the state of business blogging today. And what I found is that 65% of them, they don't get any organic traffic. And I thought that was really sad. And 85% get low or no organic traffic. That's so much. People are spending so much money on these blogs. And if not money, then they're spending their own time on these blogs. What's the deal? What gives? What is the problem here? Well, I think I can chalk it up to three main things. And it, these are at least the theories that I've come up with um, over the course of you know, my years in the industry. I, I think that these serve as like the three kind of main pillar problems. So number one, I think business blogs tend to not get the organic traffic that they could be getting just because they're thinking of their blog the wrong way. People do consume business blog content. People can find it and enjoy it and want to read it um, and it can perform well. But people tend to think or businesses tend to think that their blog is, is a publication like The Signal or The New York Times or something like that. Um, and we'll dive into each of these sections um, a little bit further. So number two, I think the other thing that's wrong is that business blogs tend to either oversell themselves or they kind of use their content to undersell themselves and they don't talk about themselves at all. And then the third main problem I think is that business blogs tend to be a little siloed. They tend to be a little too separate. They're disjointed. They're not really connected to a main business goal. So these are, I think, the three main problems. And by diving into each problem and then exploring the solutions, I think we're gonna be able to start blogging smarter rather than harder for a higher impact. So that's gonna serve as kind of like the, the outline for the remainder of this. So number one, I think business blogs need to realize that you are not the New York Times. <laughs> and that sounds maybe a little bit harsh, but it's not meant to be, it's definitely not. It's just meant to say that people don't consume business blog content the same way that they consume content in like the New York Times or The Signal or whatever you read. So businesses tend to have these assumptions based on how they think people find their content. Um, so the number one assumption that I have experienced with business owners is that they believe that people are going to find all of their business blog content from their homepage. So the idea is something like, you know, someone wakes up on a Sunday morning and brews their coffee and sits down with their tablet and they go, mm, let's go to Joe Plummer's site okay, and find the blog and let's just peruse and let's have a good Sunday morning and just browse through all of these blog topics. Um, so that's how you would read the paper, but it's not how you read business blog content. It's a little bit different. So no, people tend to not consume business blog content that way. Second of all, people tend to assume, businesses tend to assume that people are finding all of my blog content through like an RSS feed or sign up to subscribe. And there are some business models that lend really well to this. I mean, those people that um, have just general interest blogs and people sign up to receive all of their content and that's great. But if you're talking about a business like a law, for, a law firm or a dental office or a hospital or something like that, people aren't gonna be like, ooh, can't we wait to see what my dentist post next on their blog. So people tend to not not find it that way either. So the third kind of way the assumption is that people will find my business blog content through social media. And now this is definitely not a knock on social media. I d it's not meant to be at all because social media is a valuable way, I think, to get exposure and to engage with your audience and to engage with your community. But it tends to be that organic reach on platforms, especially like Facebook and Instagram is going way down. Those types of platforms are really trying to emphasize content that's posted by you know, friends and family and people that you tend to engage a lot with rather than a business. So that tends to be a little bit different. And it's also usually the fact that people are following you and seeing your content on social media if they already know about you. They've liked your page, they're already aware of you. So these businesses, if they're posting on social media, they're not gonna have as good of a chance of reaching new people, new potential customers. It's usually those people that have already known about them and engaged with them. So no, usually not. So how do people find business blog content? There's gotta be some way people find your business blog content. 
So people will find your content via search, via search engines, and that happens when they need it. So when you have a question, who do you turn to? I mean, I personally, like probably most of you turn to Google. I mean, I could be sitting on the couch right next to my husband and have a question and I don't ask him. <laughs> I, I pull out my phone and I, and I Google it. I mean, not always. I mean, I, you know, I talk to him sometimes, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I Google a lot of stuff. And I think the numbers kind of corroborate that. I mean, Google says um, 5 billion, you guys, 5 billion queries per day are searched in Google, and that's two trillion per year. And that's insane. So if you think about that, even if your business, say you're, you know, I keep using the same examples just for ease, but like if you run a dental office or whatever, you know, not all of those queries are gonna be related to dental offices and dental related things, but even a small sliver of billions is still a lot. There are still people asking questions about what you do and what your business offers. So this is the difference between inbound and interruption. When it comes to the different types of marketing, inbound says, I'm going to create really relevant, high quality content that performs. It's always on, it's always accessible, it's always available to my potential customers. And then when someone has a question, you know, they Google something, and if your content is you know, optimized well and it's you know, relevant and high quality, they're going to be able to find it. So people, your potential customers, are finding your content when they need it. Whereas interruption marketing is a little bit different. Interruption marketing kind of sounds negative. Again, there's a time and a place for all of this stuff. This is definitely not an organic search only kind of, kind of a talk. But interruption marketing says that um, I am going to put my message in front of you whether you're asking for it or not. That's an ad, right? Whereas inbound, you're posting content and people are finding it when they want it. So the people that are visiting and viewing this content, it's, they're viewing it on their time, so they're more qualified, they're more likely to engage with your business and be interested in what you have to say because they find they found it. It was their idea rather than an ad that you're kind of you know putting in front of someone when they weren't asking for it or prepared for it or they didn't even want it. So how does that change the way our businesses blog? Well, I have some tips. Hopefully this is gonna be actionable. So the first group of tips kind of centers on writing content that answers questions your ideal customers are asking. So in order to be able to do that, you have to know who your ideal customers are. Now I talk with a lot of um, businesses and depending on how mature the business is or maybe they're just getting started, um, a lot of times people don't know. They just say, well, everyone is my target customer. And that is not the right answer. <laughs> so you have to narrow. And it's okay if you don't know yet. It's totally cool if you don't know yet. Just work on getting there. Work on identifying who your ideal customers are. How old are they? What are they like? Where do they live? Ask questions like that. And if you do already have a business, start to kind of focus on, maybe you've never thought about what all of your customers have in common. Just look at your, your customers that you've had before and try to identify common themes. Oh, my customers tend to be, you know, between the ages of 25 and 36, and my customers tend to be, you know, it's always the men calling me. And, you know, you just wanna be able to identify who your ideal customers are so that you can talk to them. Because if you wanna create relevant content, you gotta know who you're creating content for. So the next question you'd wanna ask is, what problems does my business solve for them? So I can use myself as an example. Um, you know, My clients come to me at a time when they're facing a problem of, let's say for example, they just started a business and they have no idea, they know that you know, organic and search engines and all that stuff is important, but they have no idea where to get started with that. And so they come to me with that problem. Like I have a business and I wanna get attention to it. This is my, pro I need help. <laughs> so that's the problem that my business solves for people. So if you have a business or you work for someone, you know, a business owner and you're blogging for them, you're gonna wanna try to ask this question, what problems does that business solve? And from that, you're gonna be able to create a lot of or find a lot of great content ideas just from thinking and focusing on the problems that the business is solving. And if you're having trouble with this, go through your emails and contact forms to identify common questions. I think this is a really underrated um, tactic and tip. So the times I've done this before, it's been really interesting. I've gone through my, you know, my clients' contact forms just because, you know, we're. It's always a good idea to go to there for for blog post ideas. So I'd go through there and I'm like, man, everyone who's contacting them tends to ask the same question, and that's addressed nowhere on the website. 
So bingo, that's a great idea for a blog topic, things that people are commonly asking. So if you have a CRM or you, you know, however you keep track of your client or potential client communication, definitely go through that. Go through those old logs of all that old information and see what common questions and pain points people are asking you about. Think about what's most misunderstood about your industry. Um, you guys are probably all in, a, in an industry where, you know, if you explain it to a friend or a family member, there's a misunderstanding like, oh, no, that's not what SEO is. Ah. Like you probably all have that thing that people just don't get about what you do and they just don't understand it. It's really confusing to people who aren't in your industry. So think about those things. Think about the things that people just commonly misunderstand about your industry and use your blog post as an opportunity to clarify that for people say, okay, people don't understand, you know, this particular thing about SEO. Well, cool. No one tends to understand that. I'm going to write a blog post about it. That's immediately relevant content because you know that that always confuses people. It's a perfect idea for writing a blog post. Think about what the biggest barriers are to someone seeking your product or service. So there's a lot of different industries, obviously, and there's a lot of different problems in that each industry solves, but it's definitely a good idea to think about those things about your industry that people just tend to not like right off the surface. So, you know, oh, I don't want to go buy a car because I don't want to have to haggle with someone or, you know, those common barriers that someone has when they, they think about a certain type of business. So use your blog post as a chance to kind of, um, you know, talk about those things in a way that's like, I'm going to, I'm going to raise your objection and answer it and address it before you even have a chance to raise it. So use that. Just think about these in terms of creating blog topic and uh, thinking about ideas. So the next group of tips is going to surface or center on how to focus on things that people are searching. So you not only want to know your customers and you not only want to um, get to know who they are and what they do and how they act and the questions they have, you also want to understand the exact words they're using to search for what you offer. Because I know for me, I mean, there are definitely things that I assume about my industry. You know, I say, oh, everyone knows what SEO is or everyone knows what content marketing is. And that's not the case. So there's probably things in your industry that you assume like, oh, everyone knows what blah, blah, blah is that specific thing in your industry. But you realize later like, oh, that's jargon. My potential customers don't actually know what that is. So keyword research is a great way to actually find out how people are searching, the exact words and phrases people are using to kind of find information about your business. So one way to do that is just using Google itself. Now it's pretty cool. I, I typed in an example here of auto detailing. So there's no boring industries. You can even blog if you're, you know, have an auto de detailing business. So in this example, I typed in auto detailing and on the Google search results page itself, there's this thing now called a people also ask box. And it's just a, such a great idea for like getting ideas for blog post ideas. These are related questions to what you typed in. So it's amazing. You can do this with pretty much any word or phrase. And a lot of times Google will surface this kind of accordion list of questions related to it. And these are great ideas for coming up with blog posts. So another cool thing, if you see this, you can click on these and it'll just keep expanding. So if you click on one, it'll show you like five more. So there's a lot of different questions that can serve as good ideas for blog posts. And another tool, it's a free tool. I love it. Um, it's called Answer the Public, if you've never heard of it. Um, it's free up to a point. I think it's like a freemium type of product. But if you go to answerthepublic.com and do a similar thing, what you can do is type in I use the same example, auto detailing. I typed in auto detailing and what you get is a bunch of questions people have typed into a search engine that include that word. So if you're a dentist, type in dentist and see, you know, what things people are searching related to dentist. If you're, you know, whatever you are, type it in and answer the public will give you a huge long list of a bunch of different things. And it gives you uh, two different formats. This is like the pretty format that everyone's like really impressed by, but it's so hard to read. So I would switch over to the data version and just get like the list version. So if you're trying to impress a client, yeah, use the, <laughs> the right hand side one. I use that one for clients, but the left hand side is like the actual readable version. So answer the public, it's awesome. Um, another one that I love is another free tool. It's called FAQ Fox. And if you Google search FAQ Fox, um, it'll come up with the URL for this tool. So what you can do is you type in, again, to use the same example, auto detailing. So what I did was type this in. And what this tool does is it scans a bunch of forums like Reddit and Quora. 
And it's great because it'll come up with a list of forum threads where people are talking about that topic, whatever topic that you put in. So this is a great place to go and find blog topic ideas because usually people use forums and they go and ask people stuff on forums when they can't find their answer on Google. So that's like bingo, that's a great idea for blog topic ideas because no one has answered it yet. You have no competition, it's amazing. So use FAQ Fox to go and find um, blog topic ideas based on what people are searching about your industry in forums. And then, so we've kind of moved on to this third pillar here. Um, I, even though SEO is, is what I do, I'm like spending the least amount of time on like the technical aspect of it because so much of performing well in search engines is about just having high quality, relevant content that your audience wants to read. And that's the most, most important part. Google has gotten so much better at surfacing content that's actually good instead of just matching a list of ranking factors. So SEO is still important though because Google is still a machine. Google is not a human, even though it's trying to be. <laughs> Google is trying to replicate what a human searcher would pick, but it's still a machine. So there are certain things we have to do to make sure our blogs are accessible and that Google understands them, not just our audience, right? Mm -hmm. So what I would suggest is using one of these plugins if you're not already. I personally used Yoast, I think it's great. Um, it's one of those other freemium type of products. I think the free version is totally sufficient, but what it does is it makes it a lot easier to do those things that make your blogs more accessible for search engines. So things like title tags and descriptions and things like having a site map, all of those things are a lot easier with a plugin like this. So I would definitely recommend doing that. So essentially you can create fewer blogs at higher impact. We can kind of stop spinning our wheels and churning out content that doesn't perform. Because what I've seen so many times is people just like, oh man, we need to do five more blog posts for this client this month. Oh, what do we do? Um, this sounds like a fun topic idea. And we just spin our wheels and we keep like just churning out this content based on ideas that we had. And maybe some of them will stick but it, because we didn't research and because we didn't actually look into what our clients' actual customers want to read and want to know about, a lot of them won't end up performing because it doesn't hit the mark for the audience. So the second kind of pillar here is you oversell or you undersell on your blog. So if you picture like a pendulum, on one end you have the people that say, well, if, if they learn from us, they'll buy from us. And I don't know if you've seen any of these blogs, but it's been pretty prominent in the industry lately where a lot of these like consumer brands like Home Depot or like Casper Mattress, like they have start, they have launched their own blogs and their blogs are essentially, they barely talk about the business at all. They're just general interest pieces and they get a lot of traffic, but guess what? They all shut down because they're total cost centers and not profit centers. They're not making any money for the business because they're just interesting and they're not actually doing any selling. So that's one end of the pendulum. And then the other end of the pendulum, you have these people that say, well, to get the sale, you need to be a little pushy. These are the blogs where you read them and they're like, we have X years of experience and we um, buy now and click here and all of this stuff. And we've all read those kind of blogs, but that's a total turnoff, right? When the, the company's just bragging about themselves and when they're being really pushy, that's the same reason we don't like used car salesmen, right? It's, sorry if anyone's a used car salesman. <laughs> I realize that <laughs> such a negative, you could be a good used car salesman. Anyway, <laughs> on the other end of the pendulum, you have those types of people. And that's just, that's not right either. So like with most things, there's a happy medium, right? I like to say that the sweet spot for blogging for your business should hit somewhere between writing for sales and writing for enjoyment. So you have this content that's really interesting and it's helpful and it's useful and people actually really enjoy reading it, but it also is used as a vehicle to sell your product or your service. I also like to talk about business blogging in terms of bringing someone from problem aware to solution aware. So the kind of dumb example that I decided to use, I don't know why, but um, so a couple of weeks ago, my car was making this really like awful dinging noise as if like someone's seatbelt wasn't plugged in and no one's seatbelt, like we were all buckled and it was driving me nuts. I'm like, why is this happening? Every time I get in my car, the seatbelt is ding, ding, ding for a good minute or two and then it would stop. And I'm like, oh, so I had this problem. I was aware of a problem. <laughs> and so what you do when you have a problem a lot of times is Google it. So I Googled it, I'm like, why the heck is my Mazda making this dinging noise? Like what is going on? So although this didn't, the next part did not happen to me, I'm gonna use this for the sake of example. So say I found like a local mechanic and they blogged about like this, this dinging problem that can happen in your car. 
and cool because they wrote a relevant blog that people are actually, you know, that addresses a problem that people actually had, I found it. Cool, I found it in search engines. And now I'm reading about it, and as I'm reading, I'm becoming aware that there's a solution to my problem. How cool, now I know that there's a solution to my problem, and I'm learning more about how to fix it. That's awesome, but you can't stop there. If you're a business who's blogging, you can't stop there because someone's gonna be like, cool, now I know that there's a solution to my problem. Bye, <laughs> and then not even buy from the business. So what, what the mechanic should do in this situation is say, here's a solution to your problem. This is a common thing. Also, we can help. Also, we've seen this a lot before. Also, contact us. Here's an easy way to contact us and bring your car in and we'll be happy to take a look at it. Boom, that's how you bring someone from aware of their problem to ready for your solution. Another way to visualize this is just with the sales funnel, right? So if you think of that pendulum, this is like what it looks like to only focus on selling, selling, selling. You're only focusing on the bottom of your funnel. But I always like to say that if you only focus on the bottom of your funnel, if you're only focusing on buy from me, buy from me, and you're not actually informing your audience, it's like asking someone to marry you on a first date. It's like, I don't know you yet. <laughs> I'm doing my research still, okay? But then you have those people who are only focused on the awareness stage and they never actually use the awareness and all that interesting content they have on their blog to actually drive people to actually make a purchase from them. Whether that's, you know, you're an e-commerce store and you're trying to get people to purchase on your website or you are a service-based business and you're trying to get people to fill out your contact form or call you or, you know, you know do the chat bot or whatever you have on your site. So you're trying to get people from awareness to conversion. Think about it in terms of the whole sales funnel. So if you inform on the problem and you inform on your solution as well, you have the recipe for business blog success. Now the last kind of point is, is the shortest, but I think it's really important because I think a lot of business blog content is siloed. I think it's, a, it's pretty fragmented and it's not really attached to any larger business goals. You kind of have blogging over here and then you have business goals and they don't really connect. So I think we need to be thinking of blogging a little bit more holistically. And when I don't understand something, I try to make a visualization because that tends to help me. So hopefully it helps you all as well. It took me a really long time to, to understand this. Like I said in the beginning, when I first started, when I was right out of college, I was just happy to be getting paid. I did not understand how my blogging actually contributed to my client's bottom line. I'm blogging, but what is that actually doing for the business? So hopefully this helps. Number one, businesses need to write content with a goal of ranking in search engines because that's how people are gonna find you. It's one way, a really good way that you can connect with your potential customers. But I think a lot of businesses, at least a lot of the ones that I've worked with, they tend to wanna stop there. They say, get me ranking on page one and that's all I care about and then they stop and celebrate when they hit page one. And it's like, cool, but like your customers are way over here. You have not, you're only ranking. You, there's a long way to go. So after your ranking, you need to actually get that traffic. Think about the fact that you're on page one, you're sharing page one with nine, sometimes more, other URLs. What is gonna make yours stand out? You still have to win that traffic, right? So let's assume that you did win the traffic. Cool, I'm ranking on page one with my blog posts and I won the click, now I got the traffic. Now you actually have to convince those visitors to convert. You have to actually convince them to contact you. So we can't just, that's why we can't just write for machines, right? We can't just write for SEO because when we do, you've all heard or read that SEO content that's not pleasant to read because someone just stuffed it with keywords and it's kind of short and it's not very, it's just not interesting. It doesn't hit on what you need as a consumer to be ready for making a purchase. So our content also has to be compelling and it has to turn those website visitors into potential customers who are so interested in your content and they're so glad to have read what you had to say that they are willing now to sign up and fill out a contact form and become your customers. And then once someone submits a lead form, and this is assuming that you're not an e-commerce site and the purchase is done at that point, but let's assume then that people have contacted you and they filled out a contact form and called you or whatever, People are now, you have the chance to actually make those leads your customers. So what started as a blog ranking way over there has now made its way all the way to a customer. So I just think it's important to not forget what blogging is for. We tend to think of blogging over there. I wanna rank, I wanna rank, but we forget the fact that we're trying to, we're trying to actually get the business some customers. 
So to kind of wrap it up, businesses blog for three main things in, in this universe. So businesses blog to rank for relevant keywords. We want to make sure that our business blogs are actually getting surfaced in search engines and that people can find them. We also want those business blogs to engage the reader. We want them to be interesting enough to be compelling and persuasive. And we also want those business blogs to convert. They need to convert readers into customers in order for you to make a positive impact on your client's bottom line and have a positive ROI from blogging. Thanks, that's all I had. And I don't know if there is time for questions. Yeah, sure. Until someone tells me no, I'll take questions. Oh, yeah. And he write about his antique cars on his blog, and maybe someone who's not looking for a car but would read his blog about mm -hmm. antique cars go, oh, wait a minute, I just read a blog about antique cars from mm -hmm. these guys who use car dealers. Yeah. And maybe go, use, go see him to buy a car. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that you brought up. I, I think that's totally true. I think if you are blogging, you don't always have to blog directly about, okay, I, I do this so I can only blog about, like if you're a dentist, for example, I can only blog about like dental implants. Like no one wants to blog only about dental implants. So finding those interesting things where there's areas of overlap with something more interesting, definitely try to latch on to those things that are maybe areas of overlap that are, that make you more interesting, but it's still relevant to what you do in some way. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. So, going off of that, what, what would you say is like a healthy ratio between um, blog content, like we discussed in, in, in your um, talk, versus blog content that's not necessarily going to get you a sale, but it's relevant and interesting? Yeah, I think it just depends on your goal for your website. So if your goal, like I said in the beginning, is to maybe monetize some of your traffic and sell like, you know, ad space or do um, affiliate links or something like that, then just raw traffic is a fine goal because raw traffic is what's going to get you money, right? But if you're talking about using your blog to actually get business, you want people, even if it means less, less traffic, if it gets you more conversions and gets you more customers, that's what you want. So you want more customers if you're kind of operating on that model. So more traffic isn't bad. It just more traffic doesn't always equal more customers. So if you blog about the more relevant things you blog about, the greater your chances of getting really qualified leads and actual customers rather than just generally interested people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, what about uh, membership organizations where <laughs> members have, it's a yearly membership and their membership has lapsed and you want to bring them back in. Uh -huh. So this is more interruption versus, uh, I forget the other term you use. Inbound. Versus inbound. Mm -hmm. But you want them you want people that were part of your organization to see your mm -hmm. inbound traffic. Mm -hmm. You want to make them inbound, I guess. Right. So you're using interruption to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how, how do you, how do you um, I guess, get that group of people? Yeah, like to re-engage and get more loyalty back from those people that were customers. Yeah. I think um, while organic is a totally fine option, maybe that person um, has another question and then they find you through, you know, doing a Google search and they go, oh yeah, I've used them before. So you can still, that's still relevant, but it's not as targeted. It's not as if you can say to Google like, okay, only show my blog to people who used to be customers. And that's more like ad targeting and what, what you're talking about. So I think what you can do with that is you could even, you know, send an email to those people if, if you know, that you do some type of email marketing and you can say like, you know, hey, just a reminder, like here's a discount coupon or something that kind of coaxes them back in to be re-engaged with you or something like that. So maybe email and something something more targeted than inbound would probably be good if you're specifically setting out to re-engage past customers. Yeah. Cool. That's a really good question. Cool. Okay. I think that's it. But yeah, feel free to again tweet at me or <laughs> Tweet at me sounds aggressive. You can, <laughs> you can just talk to me <laughs> um, after I'll be around for a little bit. What's yeah. Website again? Oh, my website. Um, my website is soapboxley.com, and I don't have that on here, but um, I will. I will definitely post it. If you go to my Twitter profile, I have it linked there as well. So that that's my Twitter handle, and you can go to that, and you can see my Twitter profile page, and I'll have a lot of like I'll have the link to the deck. You guys can see the deck up there if you want it, um, and I'll have a link to my website and things like that. So I'll try to make all of that available. Yeah. Uh, I have a question in terms of like data. Mm -hmm. So you talked about 
I use Google Analytics. I think Google Analytics, it just depends kind of, yeah, what you want to evaluate for sure. So if I'm doing a blog content audit and I want to see how people are engaging with all of the content, then Google Analytics is perfect because that's an a way to see engagement. But if you're trying to see something like um, how many how many links have I earned, and that's getting a little bit more technical, but there are other platforms that can show you that. I mean, Google Analytics, you can see referral traffic and that's kind of a roundabout way of viewing that, but there are some platforms that are easier ways excuse me, to see, to see what you want to see. But Google Analytics, yeah, is what I was referring to when it comes to like page views. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, that made me think of another question sure. about um, Google Analytics versus Yoast. So you mentioned that you, know, you, you get used Yoast before. Mm -hmm. um, do you use those for two different things or? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. There's a lot of different tools that do a lot of different things. So it kind of gets confusing to keep them all straight for sure. Yoast is, you know, a plugin within WordPress to help you um, to help you optimize your post, which is another jargony word that just essentially means make sure it's really accessible and findable for search engines. So it's going to kind of guide you to do things like here's where you put in your title tag and it helps you do all those sorts of things. Whereas Google Analytics is more of like a not how to create your page, but how to see how your page is doing. Yeah, it's more performance and reporting rather than Yoast is helping you do the work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I kind of bypassed over that. There were like two things. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So I personally used Yoast or I use Yoast. The other one is called All in One SEO Pack. And I've heard that's good from a lot of people. I don't personally use it, so I can't like advocate it for it one way or another. But I, I like Yoast, so I, I would check that out. I can recommend that one personally. But the other one, yeah, is All in One. Mm -hmm. Cool. I don't know like what time, but we're almost there. Or who's. Yeah. Two more minutes. Two, two more minutes? Okay, cool. Yeah, if anyone has any other questions, I'm available still. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. What specific kind of data, metrics, things like that do you use? Yeah, that is, I, I should do a whole presentation just on, I, I really like going in Google Analytics and, um, do you use Google Analytics? Yeah, is that what you, so usually it, it just depends on what I'm looking for. So if I'm looking for something like pure, like popularity, like we were talking about here, how is it performing in search engines? what I would do is try to go to that report that shows me all of my channels. And I would want to see the source medium. I would want to see what traffic is coming from Google Organic specifically. And so I'd look at probably page views from Google Organic. So that would be a metric I would look at if I wanted to just see how it was performing in search engines. But if I wanted to see things like, you know, how, how are people engaging with my site and like, are people using this to view other pages on my site? Then I would look at things like bounce rate and, and average, and, you know, pages or, or um, pages per session and things like that. So it really just depends what you're looking at. But yeah, there's so much data. It's like, ah, what do I do with all of this? But um, I think if you can isolate a goal and what you're trying to see and what you're trying to evaluate, then it's a lot easier to kind of navigate analytics because you're only looking for one thing and not like all of the things and all of the metrics. Yeah. And I don't know if you've used um, analytics now. I don't know if it's still in beta, but it has that cool, like you can actually just type a question into it and it'll jump you to the report. So if you, yeah, type it in there because they know it's overwhelming. <laughs> That's why they put it in there. <laughs> this is too much. So if you just Google or Google, if you just put it in the analytics search box up there and you say like, hey, can I, uh, how many sessions did I get last month? It'll jump you to the report instead of having to like go through the navigation and through all the data to find it. So um, I don't know if it's still in beta. I, I have it on at least the properties I look at. So maybe check that out. Be helpful. It's not? Oh, cool. Cool. That's good to know. So it's definitely helpful. Use that. It's a little search bar. Jumps you to the right report. It's awesome. I love it. <laughs> cool. Oh, yeah. Ah, sorry. I'll talk to you later. I saw your hand go up first. Sorry. No, you're good. Uh, are you writing all your content yourself uh, for these customers? Uh, so, so you have to, you're studying their business and, and, and you have to really get intimate with their business, I guess, and yeah. what they're all about. Yeah, definitely. If you're a if you're a blogger or a marketer, that's going to become like your biggest skill, I would say, is your ability to kind of put yourself in the shoes of multiple businesses. So it's hard enough to like get to know your own customers, right? But then when you're a blogger or a marketer, you really do have depending on how many clients you have, you have to really put yourself in the shoes of lots of different businesses. So I have clients who are software companies and psychiatrists and all kinds of and you really have to kind of yeah, step step into that 
that role and that's how you create relevant content because we've all probably seen blogs that were written for you know different types of businesses where they go this was not written by someone who knows what they're talking about like the business owner did not write this I had a, I had a roofing company in particular that oh yeah was a marketing company and they were, they were receiving bad advice and, and they wanted to take that down yeah that's a risk for sure do you actually sub that any work do you uh yeah, I, I definitely outsource, like as my company's growing for sure, and I'm, you know, this is pretty recent, but as my company's growing, definitely, I have some people that I used to work with at my agency who are like kind of already pre-vetted because I know them um, and who I'm using to help with writing that content. But yeah, it's definitely a risk because as someone who's managed those teams of writers who have had to write for all different kinds of companies, that was the biggest struggle was people who... It's not like writing well and being able to string a sentence together is honestly not the biggest battle. The biggest battle is making sure your content doesn't say something inaccurate about the business. Because we've had that a lot of times where they say like, you know, hey, here's a blog client. And they're like, we don't do this. Like, that's not right. <laughs> and so, yeah, they're getting blogs. But man, like that's that's tricky. It's definitely tricky. You have to get to know the industry really well that you're writing for. Yeah. Awesome. I think. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Thanks. Okay, cool. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciate it. It was fun. This was cool.